everyone. This is Joan Raymond, and this is A Heart for Writing, where I um, I offer help and encouragement to writers of all genres at any stage in their writing career. And at the very end, stick around, because I was going to tell you about a free course I have that I'm offering right now. But first, I want to talk to um, my guest. Now, today's guest is a friend of mine. Her name is Natalia Chorus. She's worked in technology for a few decades. She's built a very interesting, she built a very interesting business that we're going to talk about and retired from it and now spends her time in creative pursuits, writing, painting, and managing tech products. And I'm going to bring on Natalia and we can talk. Hi, Natalia. Hey, Joan. Thanks for having me here. Not a problem. I do have to mention, I love your background. Um, it looks a lot, a little bit like my background. I have to say, Natalia is the one that inspired me to start doing my paint pouring. So she's much better at it than I am, but I had so much fun doing it. And we will talk about that more in a minute. So your first, well, I, it wasn't your first job. I am curious, what was your first job? Do you remember what your first job was? My absolute first as in right out of high school? Yeah. Yeah, it was, um, microfilming and also printed circuits. I had two jobs because uh -huh. I'm just a workaholic that way. But the printed circuit one was fun because I was programming a machine to drill printed circuit boards. Wow. And the microfilming wow. was fun because I got to read all these top secret blueprints <laughs> that an engineering company was doing for the government. So it was fun in that regard. Plus, I noticed that they misspelled safety on a regular basis, which drove me crazy. That's funny. So that was your first editing, your inclination to be an editor, right? <laughs> you know, it's funny. One of my first jobs was also microfilming back in the day, and it was medical records. And I remember every once in a while, we would put, we would make these signs like you know merry christmas or happy thanksgiving or i'm really bored today and you know we'd shoot that through so when the people were reviewing it they'd be like oh my gosh look at this they, they left us notes but that was kind of a boring job because you just kind of like shot that stuff through there but every once in a while you'd look at one of the records which ours are medical records so they were very private but there was some that made us laugh which is terrible to say right now so. Um, anyway, so let's talk about the job that you mentioned in um, your bio, which was you built a pet sitting business. Tell me more about that. That's interesting. Well, after several decades of working in technology, I wanted to build something that was fun and where the clients were actually happy to see me because mostly in my career, I did troubleshooting and help desk management, tech support management, engineering management. So all of those, really, you only hear from end users when they're upset with you because something's broken. So I wanted literally to be able to walk into a place and have people happy to see me for a change. I also love animals and have had pets all my life. Um, so it seemed like, okay, I, I know that there have got to be other people who love their pets as much as I do and who really don't care for boarding their pets because their pets get stressed out. So we started by offering um, pet sitting overnights, but we also added a couple of other fun things like what we called comfort visits, where you just come during the day a couple of times and walk or play with the animal. And then very popular was poop patrol, which <laughs> most people do not want to do, but they don't want to make their poor gardening staff have to do it. So, you know, for a small price, really, we would come and spend 10, 15 minutes picking up the poop. And that actually became very popular for a lot of um, clients. So when I started, it was myself. Then I added another employee. I actually had planned on being able to add employees at the two year mark, but I wound up having to do it at the six month mark. Wow. So that was kind of fun. And learning all about, you know, setting up 
the W4, W2 tax stuff and unemployment and all of the stuff that goes with running a small business was actually more fun to me. And of course, because I have that technology leaning, it, it was more and more fun to do that. Mm-hmm. Part of doing that, and it was kind of meant as a promotional item, but I put together what we called the whole Earth Pets directory for the Bakersfield area. And some people in the rescue and shelters may still remember that. We had them printed up. They outlined all of the services and available rescues, adoptions, veterinarians. There were articles by some of the nonprofits that do rescue. And we gave those to the um, shelters so they could give them out to new people who were adopting. Mm -hmm. So you came, you adopted a dog or a cat. You also got this directory that gave you all the services and of course we were in it because of course. Yeah. <laughs> but it turned into a really popular item we did it a new one each year for the years that we were in business wow and gave that's them awesome. to all of the rescues and things it, it was quite nice that's awesome and um and so you had the business and you said you you passed it to your clients um and help them start their own businesses. So it wasn't like you just closed down, you actually helped other people start businesses. Well, my employees had assigned clients and we had also, I was the backup for everybody. Mm -hmm. So when I was deciding to shut it down because my husband's job changed and we were going to be moving to Southern California, I offered my staff the option to take over their clients And I gave them all the information that they would need to run their business. And I actually helped them set up their businesses so that they knew how to do their taxes. They knew how to set up their accounts, how to charge, what information they would need to gather when they got new clients. We had a whole list of procedures that I worked up that had, you know, how to ask about the dog's vaccinations, how to ask about whether the dog was reactive to other dogs or not, and how to document all of that so that you had it available to you when you're actually providing care for that animal. So that was, I think, the part that was the most daunting for most people who might want to start a pet sitting business. They worry about what about the insurance and what if I get bit or what if the dog gets bit by another dog? What do I do? Uh All of that stuff I had already documented. So each of them just took off with it and I helped them for about six months and they're running quite good businesses right now. That's that's really amazing. um, I know my daughter did a pet sitting business in San Diego and she had to sign something saying that she would never do it. She would have to wait two years before she even, and she couldn't talk to her formal clients or anything. And so it's just an interesting, different attitude. And you even wrote a book on it. Um, one of the books you mentioned is, so you want to start a pet sitting business, that pet services business. So you took all that knowledge and you wrote a book about it too. So I did. that's awesome. So I'm had curious. Some fun Go things ahead. happen. So <laughs> that was one of the reasons I wrote the book. Yeah, yeah that's, that's awesome. Um, so when did you first realize you had a heart for writing? Uh, I've been writing since I was in elementary school, um, probably around fourth grade. I was one of those kids that instigated having a newspaper in our grade to talk about all of the accomplishments <laughs> and capture all of the gossip. So I've been doing school newspapers since then. In junior high, I actually started writing fiction for our school newspaper. And it was funny, looking back at it, it's hilarious. What I did was a sort of dark shadows style soap opera, but all of the characters were either modeled off of some of our favorite or not so favorite teachers and some of the prominent popular kids in the school. So kids who recognized 
um, descriptions and kind of uh, scenarios thought it was the bee's knees and everybody else just thought I was wacko. Yeah. yeah. And um, I can definitely see it being popular because, you know, you were kind of skewering some people and, you know, whatever, but I think that's great. So you write a lot of um, science fiction, speculative fiction, whatnot. What authors in, or books inspired you when you were a kid? Uh, let's see. Jules Verne, anything by H.G. Wells, um, Tolkien, obviously, just all of the standard fairy tales, too, I think, because my mind is one of those that will read anything and turn it into a, that's cool, but what if? Yeah, yeah. Um, trying to think if there was anything in particular that stood out. Believe it or not, Arthur Conan Doyle, not just Sherlock Holmes, but his Professor Challenger series was just amazing to me. And as I got older and discovered Doctor Who, the, the parallels between the characters were quite obvious to me. Mm -hmm. So I just thought, wow. Imagine if you could do, and you know, of course, brain goes off, right? And I right. go into a million different directions, but I, I think those were the main Arthur C. Clarke, um, Heinlein, oh, who else? Ursula Lorgan. I mean, were you one of those kids that would stay up late, late, late and read? Um, yes. <laughs> under, the under the covers with a flashlight, you know. <laughs> I was also one of those kids that went through all of the books in the kids section and then had to talk to the librarians to get access to the adult section. Yeah. 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 So you do, like I said, you write um, multi-genre, poetry, um, nonfiction. So can you, and, and you mentioned weird fiction. So can you tell me or tell our, our viewers here, and listeners, the difference between science fiction, speculative fiction, and weird fiction. What's the distinction between those three? Well, you know, that's going to vary depending on who you're asking. But in okay. my mind, science fiction um, uses very strict tenets of science. So if you're going to write science fiction, you'd better really understand the science that you're talking about or the technology. Speculative fiction goes one beyond. It's like the in-between space between science fiction and real fantasy. There's a blur there where you speculate what could happen if these things came to pass and some other rule of the universe that you're gonna make up and add into that story. So a good example of that is if they could figure out what the gene was that allows telepathy and started to inject it in stem cells. Mm -hmm. So if you took that and speculated where it would go, there you have speculative fiction. Okay. Weird fiction, the best way I can describe that is, do you remember the old Twilight Zones and um, Outer Limits and Night Gallery, yep. those all relied greatly on the tool of irony, but they also had an overlay of supernatural or preternatural or not quite natural occurrences that triggered that irony. Yeah, I remember so that. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Uh, I was just gonna say that to me is what weird fiction is. It seems really familiar, and then suddenly there's a twist, and you go, oh. Yeah, I remember two Twilight Zones specifically that always got me, and it was a guy that all he wanted to do was read, 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 and finally when he got a chance to sit by himself and read, he stepped on his, or somebody or he stepped on his glasses, and he couldn't read, you know. Right. And, you know, I'm probably ruining that. the plot. And then the other one was, I can't remember the whole thing, but the guy wanted everything to stop 
or something. And I remember there was these nuclear bombs coming and he said, stop. And he stopped him, but everything around him stopped too. So he had the choice of living the rest of his life by himself in this world or allowing it to happen and, and blowing up the entire world. And like I said, I don't remember everything. I just remember that one scene where he's, he's watching this thing come so close. You know, it always made me think. There was always some that made me think that, wow, you know. So you're getting, you're writing your weird fiction now, right? I mean, you are writing more of weird fiction. Is that what you're saying? Um, I do weird fiction in short stories mm -hmm. and in flash fiction format mostly because and I like the. Go ahead. No, sorry. I'm sorry. I, I was just going to say that I like the concept of writing it in such a way that it could become a vignette in a movie or a TV show or right. because so many people kind of absorb stories that way. Now, what I was going to ask is you do a lot of short stories. Most of your books that um, do you only publish on Kindle? I mean, KDP? It's only yes. e-books? Yeah. It's mostly e-books. I have some hard, like this one but mostly i like the electronic Format. publications and then you do so your own covers by my my dog here he's like oh. wandering around trying to decide whether he wants to interject something here or not oh well if he does that's okay we'll we'll let him <laughs> um and you do so your you own were, covers you do your own covers yes. right okay mostly yes that's great um, I, I was going to show, I have pictures of some of your covers here. So I'm going to show this one. Can you tell us about these three? And let me get rid sure. of my logo there. Well, the two on the end are science fiction. Um, and in fact, they're set in the same universe. Flash Forge Station and Welcome to Shangri-La. Mm -hmm. The middle one, the River Takes What You Love, is a regular fiction and it's sort of a young adult coming of age story where a young man actually figures out that he's gay okay and what about these three ah okay roderick the zombie slayer is a weird mashup of fairy tales with a twist Wind in Her Mane is a series of my poetry, and Signals from Sirius is another science fiction, and it was actually serialized on a now defunct website for a while, and so I just pulled it all together and turned it into the book. I love that picture. That's just it's an amazing picture. It's kind of humorous to me because I wrote that probably three years ago, and I was amused to notice that we're getting signals from one of the galaxies on the far end of the universe that are quite evocative uh -huh. because they seem to be in a pattern. Interesting. And that's how my book starts, is there are signals being received that are in a pattern, and it's somewhat evocative. Wow. Well, you know, um, you never know. Maybe we should read it to find out what's coming up, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd be happy if what I wrote actually comes to pass. I'd be delighted to meet some extraterrestrials. Um, not talking about extraterrestrials, but I, uh, I did want to talk about briefly you have a lot of animals that just wander around your house and um i've seen pictures <laughs> of, of the donkeys you talk of, you talk about getting visited by crows right yes yes tell, tell us about that that's um my husband to his chagrin knows that wherever we live i'm going to start accumulating wildlife <laughs> we have um a murder of crows that I occasionally set treats out for, who also will warn us when there's um, stuff ahead of us on our walks that might be dangerous. We discovered that 
during the springtime, the coyotes come out of the woodworks and they're quite aggressive. And the crows generally will warn us if there are coyotes ahead of us on the trail. Wow. And so we'll wow. turn. Um, once or twice we ignored them only to come pretty much within 30 feet of a couple of not very happy coyotes. And fortunately, my dog is a 150 pound German shepherd. So they did think twice about charging at us, but they did think about it, which most coyotes don't do. They just turn tail and go. Mm -hmm. So after that, we paid attention to the crows and didn't walk in on any more of that. <clears throat> We've also got wild donkeys in our neighborhood. And because our front yard is shady, they do come by and they're not afraid of me or the dog. And in fact, my husband continues to warn me not to invite them in the backyard because he doesn't want me to adopt them. And I have to warn him that it's not my fault. They just follow us when we're walking and they do. If they see my dog, they'll start to follow. I think he's big enough that they think he's another donkey. That's funny. That's funny. Any other yes. animals? I think you said there's other animals too. Yes, we have a possum that comes by regularly. And of course, there's the raccoon brothers. Now, the raccoon brothers are a pair of raccoons that I assume were siblings. We first noticed them when we first moved here. They were a pair of young raccoons that hung out together. They're pretty much inseparable and they're smart as whips. So they will sometimes scramble across our roof. They'll shortcut through our yard because they know that we're all wildlife friendly. They have been known to harass the Rottweiler up the street, which is kind of amusing because they'll sit on the fence and throw stuff at it. Oh my gosh, that's <laughs> funny. So, and, you know, the poor thing, of course, is wild with frustration, but, but mostly they're harmless. They've seen us on the trails and they'll stand up and look at us and then go about their business like, oh, it's just you. Oh, okay. Okay, that's funny. And then along with everything else, your animals, your your books. I mentioned your, your, um, you're very multi-talented. You're one of the most talented people I know when it comes to artsy stuff and everything else. So I'm going to show some pictures of your art. This is, um, you want to explain this or talk about this? Sure. It's I'm looking at it on my wall too. It's a uh, multimedia. So mm -hmm. there's woven, um, magazine print in there there's also some Reynolds wrap I think <laughs> and then um, pouring acrylic over that and letting it do its thing so it was fun to do and I actually liked the way it came out so that's mm -hmm. why it's up on the wall yeah it's beautiful, yeah, it's beautiful. and this is a new um, a new type of project for you explain this because this is amazing yeah, I have this um, passion for sustainability and eco awareness. So one of the things that I like to do is figure out what to do with stuff to keep it out of the landfill. So when you have um, tons of plastic and bits of yarn, you can turn them into something useful like this little basket. So that's kind of what I've been exploring. I plan on putting together a little book about how to do it. So um, anyone who sees my Facebook page will know that I, every time I finish another project, I stick it up there because I'm interested in seeing how many people are interested and what kinds of comments they make so that I can address those if I'm going to put it together in a book. And this is basically bags, plastic bags, held together with yarn and woven into a basket. Yeah, absolutely. Which is, yep. to me, is that's just phenomenal. It's and you know, it's uh, pretty amazing because the baskets are beautiful, and it's just leftover yarn, right? I mean, you're not going and buying tons of yarn, and you're not buying bas or bags. I mean, the bags are 
you know, a collector of bags. Bread bags. <laughs> um, They're bread bags. I'm looking at making plarn, which is plastic yarn. And you do that out of larger shopping bags, of which mm -hmm. I have a ton because I'm one of those people that has a bag of bags. I don't know <laughs> how many others out there there are, but I'm sure there are yep. plenty. Yeah, yeah. we and all raise our hands, yes. After a while, you, you look at it and you just go, I think these things are multiplying when we're not watching, but there's got to be something good to do besides sticking them in the recycle bin. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out those things. And um, I watched an amazing video of some young people in the Chicago area who are making the plarn and then crocheting mats for the homeless to sleep on. Hmm. So I loved that concept, and I will probably be mentioning that when I write it up. Yeah. But there's okay. so much you can do to keep stuff out of the trash, out of the landfills, that also become useful items. It's nice when you can do something that's pretty, but mostly I would like to see usefulness because I, I grew up in New England, so, you know, the drive to reuse it, repurpose it, don't throw it away if it still has anything left to give you right. is really strong. Right. That's amazing. And the fact that you're you know how to you're learning how to do this stuff and then you're writing up a book or a guide for other people to do the same thing. So, you know, it's not that you just keep these secrets to yourself. You're like, okay, this is what I'm doing. Now you can put all those bread bags or whatever to use, you know, that extra yarn. So um, you also bake. I didn't, I didn't do shots, uh, you know, screenshots of your baking, but I've seen your loaves of bread that you've posted. And, you know, I didn't want to get too many people hungry here, but I mean, just amazing. You bake and, um, you know, just, and you research and you have two blogs and um, you also do animation and web applications. So uh, we're coming down to the end of this, but just briefly tell us about the animation and web applications. Well, I have a friend in Texas, Gaston Huckabee, who does Star Trek animations. And from time to time, I assist him both on the art side and the um, script side. Occasionally, he'll ask if something is technically doable, both from the animation piece, but also from the science fiction realm. And um, that's been loads of fun. And he's working on his second installment of Star Trek. Um, he did the first one, The Paradise Makers, which is available on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And I'd be glad to send you the link to it. It's unlike the cartoons that you see on Saturday morning. It's like a full blown out drama. And it's an hour long, both parts. So it's a two hour movie. Wow. Split in half. So a lot of work goes into it. His next project is still in process because his lead artist passed away. Oh, okay. So he's having to find someone who can replicate that style. It's not me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, go on from there. But I'm looking forward to it because I, I know the script is quite good. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, um, as, a, as a creative myself, you know, I write, I do artwork. Um, and I know, obviously, you do, too. And people ask sometimes, it's like, wait a minute, if I'm a writer, do I only have to stick with writing? You know, am I cheating on my writing by doing something else? And I think, wasn't it like Leonardo da Vinci? I mean, he did all kinds of different things too. So what would you say to someone that says, I'm a writer and I need to spend 100% of my time on writing? What would you say to them? I'd say it really depends on knowing yourself. If you are one of those people that needs to be single threaded, then go for it. Just do what you do 100% and give it your all. I'm not a single threaded person. <laughs> um, in fact, 
most of my friends, we all have the same joke, which is you can be talking to me and suddenly squirrel. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know, that's a reference to the Disney movie Up and the dog is able to speak but gets easily distracted. Well, I'm kind of the same way. If I'm writing a science fiction, I might do research on artificial intelligence and something might then catch my attention that I will then go down a little rabbit hole and several hours later discover that I'm now looking at genetics. Yeah. Um, I let myself do that because I have one of those minds that will then reshuffle the deck and all those cards come back together. And that's what helps me on the technical side. I think that's one of the reasons why I was very successful on the technical side because I don't stay in one silo. I can step back and look at a larger picture and see how everything moves together in order to troubleshoot it, which mm -hmm. sounds easy, but I'm sure you know, sometimes it's hard to step out of your comfort zone and look at things from a different angle. For me, it's the opposite. It's hard for me not to do that. So you have to know yourself really well. And if you work best doing one thing at a time until it's finished, more power to you. Yep. If you yep. work best doing a lot of things and letting things inspire you that seem to be totally not connected, then do that. I think knowing yourself, that's the biggest suggestion. That's where you start. Yeah, I like that a lot. I mean, for me, if I'm writing and I can't think, I'll, I'll do some art and that'll help me, you know, process the other thing. And I won't have to be sitting there staring at a page. Um, last question. Um, advice for new writers. Would you suggest they start with short, short stories, blogs? Um, do you have any thoughts yeah, on I that? Yeah, I kind of do. There are a number of word games out there that you can use to jumpstart writing a story. Start with flash fiction. If you can write a good story in flash fiction, which is tight and you have to be really careful about what words you use to convey larger concepts, then once you get to writing something larger, it's much easier. And I say that because that's where I'm coming from. If that's not your thing, go take some classes. Classes to me are like the most inspiring, not because I'm gonna learn necessarily some new method or some new trick for getting the protagonist through a number of, you know, obstacles, but because being in a classroom situation, you're surrounded by other people who are also writing and you see one, you're not alone in any of your frustrations and two, other people can spark something that you might not have normally sparked to and you'll go back with this sudden energy to finish writing whatever it is you're working on. So there you go, my advice. That's great. That's, That's great. great. Yeah, because a lot of times we just don't think about that extra thing. I'm sorry, I'm getting an echo, I just noticed. Um, but it's just the one thing. Somebody will say one thing and it'll be like, oh, that's what I needed. And then you can finish, you know. So, Natalia, thank you so much for being here today. Um, You've been a friend for a long time and I always enjoy talking to you and this was great. I loved hearing all about your um, your coyote warning crows. I think that's just amazing. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they warn everybody else, but not everybody hears them. Well, I think you listen on a different level than a lot of people because you, you, you're so in tune with animals and, and everything else. You know, you just have this connection. And uh, I definitely can see that. So anyway, thank you again for being here. I appreciate your time. 
Thank you for having me. Um, anyway, again, thanks to Natalia for um, being here. I, I always enjoy talking to her. And um, so I want to mention in the description, you I'll have links for um, how you can find Natalia's work, her Amazon, her link to her Amazon page and her other work. And I'll get a hold of her about that Star Trek, um, the uh, Star Trek um, movie that she was talking about, or the YouTube that she was talking about. And I'll put that also in there and we can kind of promote that. And if, uh, if you haven't taken my free course yet, it's Overcoming Blank Page Syndrome. There's a link to that at the in the description and that you sign up and um, it, the videos are short, three to five minutes each and it gives you seven ideas of how to get rid of that blank page and start writing. As always, thank you for watching. Um, subscribe so you don't miss any of the upcoming chats I'm having with authors and um, we'll see you again next time.